tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. If you're listening to this podcast, then chances are good you are a fan of The Strange, Dark, and Mysterious. And if that's true, then you're in luck. Because, once again, Mr. Ballin Podcast, Strange, Dark, and Mysterious Stories is available everywhere you get your podcasts. Each week on the Mr. Ballin Podcast, you'll hear new stories about inexplicable encounters, shocking disappearances, true crime cases, and everything in between. Like our recent episode titled White Dust. After a middle-aged couple fail to answer their daughter's messages and calls, the daughter drives the few hours to her parents' house to check on them, but after arriving and seeing both her parents' cars in the driveway, the daughter gets an uneasy feeling and just can't stomach going inside. To hear the rest of that story and hear hundreds more stories like it, follow Mr. Ballin Podcast on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Prime members can listen early and ad-free on Amazon Music. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about dire delusions and twin transformations. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Sarah Jane Huntington and Marta Abromitite, our voice talents Danielle Hewitt, Michelle Kane, Kevin Barberi, and myself, Steve Taylor. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Sarah Jane Huntington and is performed by Danielle Hewitt, Michelle Kane, Kevin Barberi, and me. Steve Taylor. In it, we meet a woman desperately trying to find herself. But was she ever really lost to begin with? Now, without further ado, I present to you The House and I. I don't recall when it was that I first lost myself. Maybe it was long ago, back in the beginning. Or perhaps it was somewhere in the middle. No one can ever remember the middle of anything. The beginning or the ending. Almost everyone can recall those parts. Or should I start with the first time I saw the house, I wonder? That could be the moment when my mind truly began to slip and fray away at the edges. At the very least, it's where the careless stitches holding me together first came undone. The house itself was perfect to look at. A vast and ruthless cold beauty, isolated in the countryside, simply because it would put any other homes near it to shame. Nothing around it could compete with that enigmatic presence it held. Not even the pretty roses the gardener planted dared to bloom near. 
The effect made the land seem barren. Only I sensed the truth that no life was brazen enough to challenge this house. The house was vibrant, a manor, and it caught any passing admirer in its playful gaze. It was the plush, dominant cat, and the people inside became the little frightened mice against its relentless and beautiful power. I stood enthralled for five or more minutes, or it may have been hours. I was staring and thinking and feeling riddled with self-doubt. The curse that had plagued my own life reared its brutal head, and I'd hastily taken a step back before I caught myself. I stopped and closed my eyes tightly. I breathed in the warm of the last bits of autumn sunshine, and briefly listened to the songs of the pretty birds hidden in thick and almost naked trees. The house called me. I felt it whisper my name gently, eagerly. Its force and energy tickled my skin until I felt the static pull at my skirt. We were the same, the house and I. Both neglected, misunderstood, and yet still harsh and soft simultaneously. I walked forward, slowly at first, until I burst into an ungraceful run. Time is fickle. It ticks by too quickly if you let it, or too slowly if you pay too much attention. Time plays with memories. Our minds recall events in the wrong order. At least, mine does. Time and regret belong together, hand in hand, like lovers wandering lonely streets in the thick cold of winter. I should have run the other way, but I couldn't. As soon as my eyes landed on that home, I belonged to it, and it to me. Running would have never changed that. My job was supposed to be a simple one. I was to catalog everything of value inside and discard everything that was not. The instructions had worried me from the start. After all, who was I to decide the worth of anything? I was cheaper than an official curator, in that I would work for free and I was willing to live alone for three months in the house. I was also meant to clean. I was to scrub the house from top to toe, although it lacked toes entirely, of course. The moment I turned the ornate pretty key in the heavy oak door, I felt at peace. An emotion I'd failed to experience in years. Tranquility overcame me coupled with bliss, and I smiled broadly. I clutched my stomach in anticipation of the butterflies that were about to take flight inside me as I pushed the heavy oak door wide open. A soft burgundy carpet greeted me while a shining banister snaked its way elegantly upstairs. The last of the sunlight picked up the dust in the air until it looked like tiny orbs were drifting softly in a galaxy of their own design and creation. I could smell fresh bread, although I knew it was impossible. The house had stood empty for months. I knew that. The door swung shut behind me, and I hadn't even realized I stepped inside. Home, my mind whispered. You're home, Anna. I set my suitcase down and shrugged off my coat. I slipped my heels off and felt the immense freedom and relief in being apart from the absurd shoes that made up the clothing, the costume I wore. First things first, I decided. Tea. The kitchen was modern, with stainless steel surfaces that gave it a cold, clinical feel. The gunmetal colors felt unnatural, an imposter room in an extraordinary house. I tested the power was on, pleased to find it working. I filled a kettle that was likely more expensive than my entire wardrobe and prepared myself to explore. Upstairs first? I asked myself out loud. I acted as if it were Christmas morning and I'd been gifted the whole house. I ventured into each room respectfully, 
at first, until I couldn't help myself. I bounced on beds, single ones, and a glorious regal four-poster one that I knew would be mine. I opened wardrobes and brought the clothes inside up to my face. I touched and smelt, caressed and embraced every item. I ran my fingertips over every surface, and not once did I grimace at the thick dust. I only felt a steely determination to bring the house back to the beautiful glory it deserved. The bathroom has a claw-footed tub. I squeal with delight at the discovery. I couldn't wait to have a bath and to feel the hot water embrace me. For many years, I was only ever able to have showers. A single door stood at the end of a long landing. I pulled and yanked until it gave in and opened. An attic greeted me. One full of broken furniture, cracked mirrors, and porthole windows. I raced back downstairs, giddy with excitement, at more rooms to explore. The main living was lined wall to wall with thick, dusty, leather-bound books and expensive wooden furniture. I had the curious sensation of having been miniaturized and popped into an antique doll's house mansion. A pale wooden door stood soldier-like at the end of the living room, and I opened it with a flourish. Boxes. It contained row after row of boxes. Each one had a number handwritten on its side. I assumed they were the items I had to value. A second sitting room contained pretty decorative plates with matching cups and saucers, all kept locked away in glass cabinets. Portraits hung on the walls, paintings of elegant beauties and portly happy men. The room adjoining was stacked high with boxes too. I opened one and found stamps kept precariously in leather folders. Another one had a remarkably old teddy bear with one glassy eye stuffed inside. A big wooden chest held jewelry in smaller boxes. They each played music as a tiny figure spanned in circles. You're forever stuck, I whispered to the ballerina. I knew how she must feel. Don't think about it all now, Anna. I warned myself. I have three months. Three whole wonderful months. Don't think about him. I fetched my tea and rummaged for biscuits. I noticed a stack of notebooks and a single pen on the side with a carefully balanced note placed on top. I opened it greedily and read out loud. Dear Anna, please make yourself at home. The housekeeper has filled the cupboards with food, also the fridge and the freezer. Enclosed is 50 pounds, should you need it. Any issues, please call Mary. Her phone number is included. We will meet you on our return, by which time you will have catalogued and priced my father's belongings. I crossed the room and opened the fridge. As promised, it was jammed full of food. Each cupboard was overflowing almost. I was undernourished, too thin. I looked forward to cooking extravagant foods and taking full care of myself. It was at that moment that I began to cry. Not from sadness, nor pain, but from the sheer joy of my new situation and freedom. I'm going to be okay now. He won't find me here. He'll never find me. Safe. I'm finally safe. My tears turned to wild laughter. Later that evening, I lay in the bath for almost two hours until my skin turned as wrinkled as dry fruit. I chose the room with the rocking chair and four-poster bed to sleep in. A deep weariness overcame me instantly. I couldn't remember the last time I was able to have a full night's sleep. Nor could I recall the last time I'd felt true happiness. I sensed a deep understanding. I had already overcome everything terrible in life, and now all I had to do was heal. I climbed into the luxurious bed, not caring if the sheets were clean or not. 
heavy with exhaustion, I closed my eyes. I felt the house breathing softly. I felt the home watching over me and caring for me. I felt its kindness and compassion and the knowledge brought comfort. When I opened my eyes in the night and saw the rocking chair swaying gently, all by itself, I smiled and felt more at peace than ever. In the morning, I wolfed down some toast and got to work. I found all the cleaning items a person could ever need to be crammed into a dark and small, almost hidden cupboard. I rolled up my sleeves and scrubbed, dusted, and hoovered. I washed everything and began to make sense of who had lived in the house. I knew the owner had recently died, a gentleman named Albert, and I knew the home was now his daughter's possession. I pieced together that the clothes in the main bedroom belonged to Albert and his deceased wife, Elizabeth. She owned beautiful clothing. Cashmere, soft cotton, tailored linens, and fitted dresses. I hadn't been able to bring many clothes. My suitcase contained just two old shirts and a single pair of jeans that were far too big. I should wear her clothes. At least, just while I'm here. So I did. I washed them first and tumble-dried whatever I could. I cleaned the bathroom and washed the wooden panel walls along the hallway. Before I knew it, it was lunchtime and the doorbell rang. I froze, terrified. It's him. He found you. Hide. Quickly. Don't let him get me, please. I begged the house. Please. My breath came in big, ragged gasps as my hand shook. I dropped my bucket and threw myself in a corner and into a ball. No, 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 no. I sobbed. I felt the house wrap itself around me to protect me. It held me close until the feeling of peace returned and my panic subsided. The front door opened a crack as a gray-haired lady poked her head inside. That's the housekeeper. The house whispered to me. Hello? Is anyone here? I stood wiped my face and smoothed down my clothes. The house filled me with the power and confidence I needed. I plastered a fake smile on my face and waved brightly as I walked toward her. Hi, I'm Anna. I wasn't expecting anyone I was cleaning. Hello, I'm Mary. I'm the housekeeper. Well, I'm retired now. I wondered how you were getting on, that's all. I said to my husband, I'd better check on that young lady up at the house all on her own. See if she needs anything. That's kind. Thank you. I was vaguely aware that I should offer her a tea or coffee, but I felt as if she was trespassing on me and the house. Well, it's no trouble. How are you getting on, dear? Just fine. Oh, I see. Well, I won't keep you then. If you need anything, I'm in the nearest house on the left. Thank you. I appreciate it. I said, because that's what people are supposed to say. I knew that. Mary nodded and waved. She closed the door behind her with a sharp click. I turned the key and drew the heavy bolt across. I didn't want her sneaking into the house again. Into my house. For the first few days, time passed quickly and smoothly. I took advantage of the soft breeze outside and hung baskets of washing out. The house looked immaculate. It was no longer neglected. It shone proudly. At night, I liked to lay in my kingly bed and smile. The house began to speak to me. Not the odd sentences it whispered from day one, but long, intricate, and wonderful tales. I learned that it was built in the 1900s, on old pagan land. The covered old well at the end of the massive garden was all that remained of the ancient, yet still powerful magic. I learned that the house had many owners over the decades, although its favorite was Albert. He loved the home so much he never left. The house had become his anchor, and the chain to bind him was a short one. I envied him, 
even though he was dead. I felt a sting of sharpened jealousy that he was preferred. The walls whispered a lullaby to me as I fell to sleep each night, a song half remembered from my childhood. One night, I awoke to the sound of footsteps, a whole clamor of them outside. They clattered away on the wooden floor in the hallway. I drifted across the room and peered around the door. I saw three children, dressed in old-fashioned clothing, racing about in a game of chase. One had blonde hair, as yellow as summer wheat. The others had dark hair and curious, clever eyes. I gently closed the door and left them alone. I understood the house was telling me its stories and showing me its precious, happiest memories that were embedded within the walls. Thank you. I whispered and climbed back into bed. The sounds of the children laughing and playing lulled me back into a happy sleep. When I awoke again, pressure pressed down on me, and I hadn't been able to move, not one inch. I recognized the familiar feeling and I knew it would fade quickly. By the time I could move, I looked down at myself. My borrowed nightshirt was covered in blood. What have you done? His voice sounded so close, but I knew it was impossible. It's not real. He's not here. He's far away. He can't find you. Reality blurred. Half of me knew I was stuck in a memory, one that was worn out and replaying again tiredly. I screamed in confusion and the house came to my defense. Warmth engulfed me as I rocked back and forth. It's not real, I chanted. It's not real, not anymore. The feeling of love spread its way all over me until my heart calmed its frantic beats. Safe. The house told me. You're safe. I curled up into a ball and sobbed loudly. Like a mother's embrace, the walls and floors itself rushed to soothe me as the visions faded. No blood, see? There's no blood. Everything is okay. It was hours before I could move properly again. My body felt on fire and my limbs hurt from tension. I soaked in the bath, unafraid to show the house the scars on my body, while the house itself told me the tale of its birth. An architect, by the regal name of Alexander Booth Chambers, designed and built her from the ground up. He died in the house he loved and refused to leave. The energy the house gave was the tie to bind. The unconditional love in bricks and mortar that most craved, and still never found. I understood. I understood everything. After my bath, the feeling of tranquility returned. I began to sort through Albert's belongings. I wrote neatly in my given notebooks and estimated prices. Was I right? I doubted myself entirely. Keep that. A deep voice from behind me spoke. I jerked and turned. Albert himself was sitting in one of the plush red armchairs I admired the most. He wore a smart shirt and a cardigan, pressed trousers, and thick socks. He grinned and I liked his face straight away. He looked like a kind man, with one of those open, friendly faces of bright eyes and thick wrinkles that suited him. He was as refined as I expected. Hello. I hadn't been surprised to see him. It somehow felt inevitable. I wasn't scared either. I felt sure the house had arranged for our meeting. If the home loved Albert, then I should too. Keep that. I don't want that thrown away, please. I looked at my hands. I held a fat old compass peppered with rust. Shall I clean it? Albert smiled and began to become translucent. As I watched, the deep red of the chair behind him started to show. He nodded and winked once, and in a single blink, he was gone. The encounter hadn't troubled me. It gave me more of an incentive to have everything right and to work even harder. 
I cleaned that compass until its surface resembled a mirror. I placed it gently on the mantelpiece of the fireplace with great respect. Later that same evening, the walls began to bleed. I watched, horrified, as blood poured down the freshly scrubbed stairs in waves. I saw it leak in massive streams down the main wall in the living room. What's happening? I felt afraid for the house and not for myself. I ran to the bleeding wall and pressed myself against it. I sang the same lullaby it had sung to me. I stroked the wet walls and told it I won't ever leave. I promised to stay, somehow. The bleeding stopped abruptly, and I slid down the wall. I'm sorry you're in pain, I told the house. I understand it. I really do. The room shuddered and took a deep breath as I curled up beside it. I slept there all night, with one hand stroking the wall for comfort. The next day, the house and I both felt wonderful. You have secrets, it whispered to me. Yes, and someday I'll tell you, but not today. Overnight, the blood had disappeared as if it were never there. I began to catalog Albert's treasures, and I threw nothing away. He appeared once. He stood over me with a proud smile and dissipated in the way that fog is sometimes prone to do. Before lunch, I decided it might be best if I threw my suitcase down the old well. I don't know if I thought of doing that, by myself, or if the house planted the idea inside of me. It was still by the front door. It stood abandoned near my coat. I grabbed it and patted across the dewy grass. The further away from the house I got, the colder I started to feel. The emotions of terror and confusion began to overwhelm me. I fought off a nasty wave of dizziness that almost turned my vision black. I dropped my case near a dying bush and ran back inside. I shut the door firmly and slid the bolts across. My hands were shaking terribly. Being away from the house felt alien, all twisted and wrong. I knew then that I had to find a way to be able to stay. I knew that I couldn't leave. I wouldn't leave. I love you. I said out loud. I didn't feel any shame or any embarrassment admitting that. A wave of gratitude engulfed me in return for my confession. I placed my head against the walls and smiled. I'm never leaving you. We belong together. On the eighth day, I decided to have a rest day. I had been working hard every moment since I arrived. I cooked fresh soup from scratch in the clinical kitchen, and I sat by the fireplace to eat. A lady wandered through, just as I was lifting my spoon. She wore an elegant beige dress of lace and silk. She walked in with an air of grace, and I watched astounded by her beauty. Her light-colored hair was tied up in a complicated knot, and a string of pearls decorated her thin neck. Her blue eyes, with wonderful long eyelashes, landed on me. Hello, dear, she said in a magical, glorious voice. Hello. Have you seen Albert? Not today, I'm afraid. She smiled and revealed a perfect row of teeth. The sight of her made me breathless. She was so exquisite. She wandered straight through a wall and vanished. I laid down my tray and raced straight upstairs. I knew who she was. Albert's wife, Elizabeth. I yanked open the wardrobe in the room that was mine and rummaged inside. My hands landed on the texture of lace, and I pulled the dress out. It was the same one the lovely woman had been wearing. It was slightly damaged and faded, but I shrugged out of my own borrowed clothes and slipped it on. Downstairs, among the boxes of jewelry, I found her pearls, and I put those on too. I danced in the living room to music only I could hear. The house laughed along with me. I felt deliriously happy. 
I moved in circles and raised my arms in the air. I cried happy tears and let them run down my face. Then the doorbell chimed. At first, I ignored the sound. I doubted the housekeeper would understand if she saw me, and I assumed it was her. The knocking came moments later, and I froze at the urgency hidden within the wraps. I crouched down low behind Albert's chair. Nobody can get in. It's all bolted up. He can't find you. The knocking sounded at the window and made me yelp in fear. Help me. I called to the house. Please, help me. Catherine! A man's voice bellowed. Open up! I'm here with the police! Who's Catherine? The voice sent a familiar chill of cold panic into my bloodstream. The knocking started up again, even louder than before. I flinched and ducked down low. Open the door! Another gruff and deeper voice ordered. I clamped my hands over my ears, squeezed my eyes shut and waited. Please, 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 please. My mind prayed. After two minutes of silence, I began to feel hopeful. Have they gone? They must have gone. The house remained silent as I started to breathe easier. The tension in my body eased. The sudden and massive sound of breaking glass made me scream in terror. Everything happened so quickly that it all became jumbled in my head. Glass broke on the rear door and bolts were undone. I screamed in fury as three tall men came in. Two policemen, both led by him. He'd found me. In the distance, I heard the whiny voice of the housekeeper telling them to be careful as my eyes met his. He stared at me in horror. Go away, I see. Catherine, what have you done? I'm Anna. I'm Anna. I'm Anna, I shouted. I curled myself into a ball and hissed like a cat. I couldn't begin to understand how he'd been able to find me. My heartbeat thundered in my ears as he walked softly toward me with his arms raised. One of the policemen moved to hold him back, but he shrugged them off and stepped forward, as if he were approaching a wild animal. How I hated him at that moment. Anger filled me completely, all the way to the marrow of my bones. It's okay, Catherine. We can sort this mess out. I'm Anna. No, Catherine. You're not. No, I'm Anna. He shook his head and stared at me with pity. I hated that look as much as I despised him. Sir? One of the policemen said as his radio burst with static. It's all right. Catherine is my patient. I'm a doctor. I can deal with this. The house will help me. The house loves me. Catherine, do you recall running from the hospital? Do you recall the events on the train? I caught the train here. Yes, we know. The woman you met, the real Anna, she's awake now. She has been able to tell us about the attack. I closed my eyes and saw blood. Blood was all over my hands and lap. The dizziness made my head jolt. Someplace far off in my mind, I had the beginnings of an idea. No! I'm Anna! You attacked the real Anna. You made friends with her and then attacked her. As soon as she woke up, she was able to tell us where you might be. You stole her job and her key. You are in a delusion, trapped in one. Is that true? It, it can't be. I'm Anna, aren't I? He's lying. He lies. I don't understand. I said because I didn't. I can sort this out. Come with us quietly. We can help you. He lies. The house can help me. The house can protect me. He turned to the waiting policeman. I have this under control. Give us a moment, please. The bulky shapes of the police officers left the doorway. I saw my chance, and I took it. 
I stood and darted past him as his eyes widened in alarm. I raced out of the doors and up the stairs. Run, the house told me. And so I did. I sped down the hallway and ignored the shouts of shock and anger. I threw myself at the attic door. I fumbled for the handle and I yanked. The door opened without protest and I slammed it behind me. I drew the bolt across and stopped to wipe my tears away. Memories collided as the present and the past began to play simultaneously in my mind. I could smell the distinctive oily scent of the train station as I stood among the broken bits of furniture dotted around. I could almost hear the sounds of a train approaching, and I could almost feel the vibration under my feet. I had caught a train. I had. That part was true. I sat in one of the many spare seats with my stolen coat wrapped around me, and I smiled at a pretty, smartly dressed young woman. She told me she was on her way to a new temporary job, one where she had to price up items in a rambling old manor house. A job just like mine. I leaned heavily against the old oak cabinet and sank to the floor. I saw images play in my mind like an old movie. Memories. White walls and nurses dressed in white. Injections of clear fluid and pink tablets. Him. Sitting at his desk with his unread books displayed behind him. Judging me. Watching me. A visit to an outside frightening world. An open gate. A chance to run. A chance to escape. I am undone. I've come undone. I'm crazy. Mad. Delusional. Just like they said. I saw blood on my hands and I wiped them on my pretty borrowed dress. And when I looked again, the blood was gone. What do I do? I asked the house, pleaded. The walls and the roof seemed to hold their breath while they reached a decision. In the corner of my eye, I saw Albert gazing out a tiny porthole window. Albert, I said. What do I do? He turned to stare at me. He held out a wrinkled hand towards me. Elizabeth. He smiled. There you are. No, I'm Anna. Or Catherine, or I... I don't know. Pounding on the attic door made me jump as I stifled a scream. I spun around expecting to see a sudden rush of police officers about to snatch me. The door held firm and remained shut. When I looked back, Albert had disappeared again. I felt the house give me a gentle nudge forward toward a window. It was a large one I hadn't noticed before. It was big enough to fit a person through. Big enough for me. You belong here, the room told me. And quite suddenly, I had the clarity to see what I had to do. Behind me, the door began to splinter, and I glimpsed a single eye of his as he peered in. Catherine, please. You can get well. Please. He lies, the house breathed. I stepped forward and pushed the window open. I inched my way outside until I balanced on a ledge. Two police cars sat like toy cars beneath me. A gray-haired lady stood between them, wringing her hands in desperation. Mary, the housekeeper. All around me lay a patchwork of fields, all tinged with brown and orange colors. The sky had a glorious blue hue, with an odd cloud dotted around. More clouds made their way toward me come to witness my rebirth. Jump, the house whispered to me. My dress swayed in the breeze as the pearls around my neck turned cold. I jumped. Time moves differently here. Sometimes I see the children, sometimes I see Albert. I often see Elizabeth wandering by serenely. I even met the architect once. New people live here now and the house doesn't like them. So I don't think they'll get to stay. Flowers were left for me. A whole bunch just for me. 
He and the old housekeeper placed them gently on the drive, on the very spot I landed. The place where they covered my body with a sheet from the washing line. Roses. Beautiful red roses. They faded quickly and started to rot. I never saw them again. Time moves slowly. Or it moves too quickly. It depends on if I happen to be looking or not. I talk to the house a lot, and it talks back to me. I am wanted and needed. I am part of an exquisite wonder on an ancient land. Madness no longer plagues me. I am clarity. I am alive in my death. This quiet, melancholy existence of wandering fulfills me. Who would have believed that in death, I would find my true life? I hope you enjoyed The House and I, as written by Sarah Jane Huntington and performed by Danielle Hewitt, Michelle Kane, Kevin Barberi, and myself, Steve Taylor. Our second tale of the evening is written by Marta Abromitite and performed by Danielle Hewitt. In it, we meet Jacqueline and Jody, a pair of twins separated in one of the worst ways possible. Now, without further ado, I present to you my twin sister. Let me start this off by saying that I'm a twin. Growing up, people would always comment on how freaked out they were by Jacqueline and me. How odd it was. Isn't it weird how alike you are? People would say. It's almost unnatural. Kids are ruthless. Everyone knows that. I was never sure if their lack of tact was down to their undeveloped brains or just plain old cruelty. I didn't think there was anything weird about being a twin. But then I wouldn't, would I? It never bothered me. I had always assumed that it never bothered Jacqueline either. But that was a mistake that I had learned too late. I took her lack of communication for granted. I had assumed when I should have scrutinized. I was willfully blind to her transformation when I should have seen. I didn't see. Jacqueline and I were extremely close as children, just like twin sisters are supposed to be. We did everything together. It was almost routine. Anything she did, I did, and vice versa. We were in our own little world that nobody could penetrate, not even our parents. We had this everlasting, unimaginable bond that no one could comprehend. No matter how hard they tried. I knew that it was unbreakable on the surface. But I even went as far as to liken our sistership as indestructible. At an atomic level, and nothing could keep us apart. After a while, though, things started to change. We were approaching adulthood. Reaching that age where we were desperate to be individuals. Or I think Jacqueline was, at least. I was happy for things to stay the same. I was so content in my own bubble of monotony that I had failed to see how rapidly Jacqueline was changing. It all started off small, the changes. They do at first, don't they? That's why you don't always notice them. I remember being somewhat taken aback when she'd come home one evening. What have you done? I said, eyes wide. It's just hair, Jody, she replied. I laughed it off, but deep down it hurt me. I couldn't understand it. Why would she want to look different to me? I didn't push it, though. Hair is hair, I thought. We were still the same in every other sense, and looks were superficial. 
At least that's what I tried to tell myself. Looks were superficial. Then she started to change her clothes. She did everything she could to avoid wearing anything even closely similar to me. We would always plan our outfits and everything we owned was the same. But I started seeing clothes on her that I had never seen before. Ripped tights, loose-fitting dresses, and jumpers. Things that didn't look right on her. But she wore them anyway. Everything she wore was the color of oatmeal. Bland and tasteless. And I couldn't understand it. I knew something wasn't right. But I just couldn't say anything without sounding deranged. Controlling, even. Jacqueline was allowed to wear whatever she wanted. I didn't own her. I tried not to question her. I tried to let her be. I figured she was going through something that she couldn't speak about. Something she couldn't share with anyone, even me. I tried not to let the worries and anxieties get to me, even though I could feel them in the pit of my stomach, threatening to overflow and drown me. I was desperate to know what was happening to my sister. As time went on, things started to get stranger. I could barely recognize Jacqueline anymore. It was difficult to comprehend the utterly insane changes that I was witnessing with my own eyes. But reality can be skewed when everything you thought you knew comes into question. I found myself looking at her and seeing someone completely different. And I couldn't understand how that could be possible. Our parents were none the wiser. They just thought she was going through puberty. Even when things started to become... Terrifying. They chose not to see it. They chose ignorance. Jacqueline would spend her days roaming the streets of London. I had no idea where she was going or what she was doing. She would come home in the early hours of the morning and would spend the rest of the night creeping around the house. I didn't know what she was doing, and I didn't think I wanted to know. Some nights I would hear her skulking around like a lizard and stop outside my room and just stand there for what seemed like hours. I'll admit it. I was terrified of her. The day I decided to confront Jacqueline was the day I lost her forever. I remember that evening like it was yesterday. Trauma does that, right? You relive those moments over and over and it doesn't matter how much time passes because it always stays with you. Time is supposed to be the healer of all things, but I think that expression exists and acts only as a placebo, something you're supposed to tell yourself in the hope that your life could be bearable again. But when something happens that alters your entire existence, it can never be quite the same, can it? No matter what you do. It was midnight and by this time I would already be in my room with the door locked. I knew I had to see her for myself, talk to her, see if there was anything I could do to save her from whatever this was. The house was as still and silent as a nursery. I could hear my own heart drumming against my chest. I had decided to wait in the dark. My only source of light was the night sky illuminated by moonlight. I didn't want to startle Jacqueline when she returned, so I kept the lights off. I didn't have to wait long before I hear the keys jangle and the lock turn. She was home. When she stepped into the moonlight, I gasped. The flesh on her body hung and sagged off of her like an ill-fitted suit, baggy and shapeless. The color of her skin was pale and gray, bruised almost. Her cheeks were sunken in like potholes. Her mouth was torn, bloody, and cracked. The skin peeled off as she moved her mouth, falling onto the floor like flakes of dandruff. She looked like she was decomposing. There was no other word I could use to describe it. What's happening to you? I asked. She opened her mouth to speak, but no sound escaped her chapped lips. Instead, she made the most guttural sound I have ever heard. 
It was earthy, low and intense, like a growl of someone who has had their mouth sewn shut for decades. Jody. It was like she exhaled my name. I could barely hear it. Jacqueline, please, talk to me. What happened? I pleaded. She began to move and I can hear her bones creak and groan like rusty gates swinging shut. The way she moved was so unnatural, stunted almost, like watching something in slow motion. She was coming towards me, her hands outstretched. The flesh on her hands was peeling and blistered, red raw like the flesh of a newborn. She limped toward me, and I found myself recoiling back at the gruesome sight of her. Even though she was Jacqueline, she was my sister. I couldn't bear to look at her. They did this to me. She managed to whisper. Who did? I asked. They said shedding old, inferior flesh would make room for new, superior flesh. She croaked. What does that mean, Jacqueline? I asked her. I could feel the tears trickling down my cheek. She held something in the palm of her hand. It looked like a pendant from where I was standing, but I couldn't quite make it out. They promised me I would be different. They promised me that I would be elevated. She said. Her eyes lit up like candles when she uttered those words. Who are they? Jacqueline, I asked, taking a step forward. The pendant glowed in her hand. It radiated this bright red hue that almost lit up the room. They're going to come for you too. Just as they did me. They're going to come for all of us. She said. The flesh on her palms drooped like pieces of old kebab meat on a skewer, barely hanging on to the sinewy muscle and bone. She then began to... shed. That's the only way that I could describe it. The flesh that encased her bones began to fall away like wet parchment paper. Piece by piece, until she was nothing but a wet, glistening, and sticky skeleton. You'll see, Jody. She spoke again. I watched as she disintegrated in front of my eyes, melting away like wax on a burning candle leaving only a small, bloody puddle. That was the last time I saw my sister. It's difficult to describe the weeks that followed. Everything was a blur. Everyone in my little world believed that Jacqueline ran away. She was reported missing, but no one really took it seriously. Not even my parents. Police, doctors, family... Everyone around me thought it was nothing but a phase. I couldn't fathom how utterly nonchalant everyone was. Even if Jacqueline did go missing, there was no urgency, and I couldn't understand it. As time went on, she was forgotten entirely. No traces of her remained. No one remembered that Jacqueline even existed. I soon found memories of her slipping from my mind, too. I began forgetting the little things to begin with. Like the shape of her face. What color her eyes used to be. And the sound of her voice. Could that be possible? The day that I found the pendant was the day that my life ended. I woke up gripping it tightly in my hand one morning, having no idea how it got there. This was the first time I noticed it, too. The skin on my hands. It looked thin and pale. Almost translucent. It reminded me of my grandmother's hands. Aged, faded, and covered in liver spots. What was happening to me? The changes were slow but evident. After a few weeks, I could barely recognize myself in the mirror. My hair had thinned and fallen out completely. A few wayward tufts remain, but they were wispy and sparse. My skin had become gray, transparent and flaky. 
I was putrefying, but I couldn't understand why. Something about it felt familiar, but I couldn't quite place my finger on it. It was like a long-lost memory. The longer I held the pendant, the more I aged. But the curious thing was, I couldn't let it go. As much as I tried to release my grasp on the detestable thing, I just couldn't. When I examined the pendant, the less I remembered where I'd seen it before. Have I ever seen it? It was covered in those curious patterns I could scarcely describe and words I didn't understand. It was unlike any alphabet or language I had ever seen. But it was what was engraved in the middle that terrified me. It had two heads, supported by an elongated neck. The heads themselves were oddly shaped and lumpy, protruding at odd angles. They looked soft, swollen, and filled with fluid. I don't know how I could tell, but I just could. It had no eyes, only barren, cavernous holes where eyes should be. The only thing that covered the bulbous face was an abhorrent smile. It stretched from ear to ear, like it had been carved so that I could be as wide as it was. It was jagged and uneven, much like the rest of it. The mouth was filled with rows upon rows of razor-sharp teeth that oozed a thick, sticky substance that resembled sewage water. I knew it didn't have eyes, but I could feel it looking at me. What do you want? I asked, barely recognizing the croaky whisper that escaped my lips. Hasn't this already happened before? Did, did it already happen to me? Or was it someone else? I couldn't remember. I tried to grasp at the memories, like drowning kittens gasping for air. But they slipped further and further from my clutch the harder I tried. Shed your skin. Become one with us. It said extending a sinewy, leathery hand. Make room for new, superior flesh, Jody. You promise? I heard myself asking. What was I saying? Why was I saying these things? We promise. You aren't the first, and you won't be the last, Jody. We promise to make your world ours, just like we have with others. I could feel myself fading, and then everything went black. We will give you a glimpse of what it'll look like. Close your eyes, Jody. When I opened my eyes, my vision was blurry, and I could barely move. When I looked down at my body, I saw that my flesh was charred, blackened, and broken. I was on my back, but I couldn't see what I was lying on. It didn't feel like I was supported by anything but merely suspended in the air. I turned my head, and that's when I saw her. She was fused to me. Her skin melted into mine. Who was she? She reminded me of someone that I knew long ago but no longer recognized. For a moment, I thought she looked like me. I looked around. The sky was black, impenetrable and never-ending, but somehow I could see. It didn't take me long to see the others. They were all hanging in the air, the same as me. Their skin scorched and torn, blended and melted to the one lying next to them. There were thousands of them, all lined up as far as the eye could see. Then I heard the voice again. This is your new world. I hope you enjoyed My Twin Sister, as written by Marta Abramitite and performed by Danielle Hewitt. 
You can find more of Danielle Hewitt and Michelle Kane over on the Creepy Podcast at www.creepypod.com. Both of tonight's tales were provided to us by our friends at Velox. Find out more about these and many other tales at www.veloxbooks.com. On to the shows. Longtime resident Otis Jiry has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. And Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. And don't forget to check out the Fear from the Heartland archives, featuring more than 120 episodes. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you've not done so already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. See you next Monday. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 